Good afternoon, everyone, or uh, good morning or good evening, according to where you are. Uh, my name is Tim Huxley. I'm executive director of the Asia office of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Singapore. And it's my very great pleasure to uh, welcome you to today's IISS webinar on the topic of China's weak cyber defenses. We're very fortunate to have uh, two terrific speakers with us today. Um, first of all, Dr. Greg Austin. Uh, Greg is a Senior Fellow for Cyber at the IISS Asia office in Singapore. He has long experience as an expert on both China's security and on cyber matters in government, uh, as well as in academic and research institutions. He's been with the the IISS Asia office since last year, and he runs the IISS cyber program internationally. We also have with us Dr. Simone Dossi. Uh, Simone is Assistant Professor of International Relations at the University of Milan, uh, where he teaches the international relations of East Asia and also international political thought. He is also a non-resident research fellow at the Torino World Affairs Institute, where he contributes to the Global China Research Program. His research interests include China's foreign policy, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and uh, a, a range of issues uh, connected with uh, security, cybersecurity, military reforms, and civil military relations in China. He's published widely and is author of a book on China's uh, uh, naval doctrine. To start off this webinar, uh, Greg Austin is, is going to um, speak and give us his views on China's weak cyber defenses, uh, after which Simone will um, give his, uh, his perspective and his reactions to uh, what uh, Greg has said. So. Uh, over to you, Greg. And, and I should say that, of course, after uh, Greg and Simone have, have spoken, uh, there'll be uh, plenty of time for discussion and uh, questions and answers. Over to you, Greg. Well, thank you, Tim. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. It's uh, very great to have you here. And thanks for making the time. So the presentation today is based in part on a book I published in 2018 called rather innocuously cybersecurity in China, but it was really about China's cyber defenses. So cybersecurity is another word really for cyber defenses. Uh, and today I'm going to update some of the findings in that book. I've actually prepared a draft article to, uh, to uh, provide that update. Uh, and the presentation today uh, is based on it. So in pre preparing for some work with IISS in uh, another area, I found this rather interesting statement uh, from the commander of United States Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Davidson, where he was talking about uh, war with China. Uh, and it was a rather interesting speech. Uh, he said that the United States didn't want war with China, uh, but if, the United States, if, if China decided to provoke the United States to war, then this is what the United States would do to it. And you'll see in uh, yellow highlighting in the second paragraph, the proposition that the United States believes that it can penetrate and bring about the disintegration of China's uh, systems and decision-making. And through that process, uh, defeat their offensive kinetic capabilities. So the United States is very much focused on that proposition, whether it can actually achieve it is another thing. So that's a departure point uh, for the seminar today in part. The basic hypothesis is that Chinese leaders believe that the country is weak to very weak in cyberspace. And you may be surprised to learn that uh, China worries about 5G threats uh, arguably more than Western countries worry about 5G threats. Uh, so if China's cybersecurity is weak, and there's all these new 5G systems around connecting the internet of things uh, without the necessary security, then that presents a very big vulnerability, vulnerability to China, regardless of whether 
the 5G is owned by Chinese corporations. But in addition, Chinese leaders are deeply annoyed that they still have to rely on US-based corporations for basic software that's used by the government. And the best example of this uh, is Windows 10 for government brackets Chinese. In late 2017, Microsoft and the Chinese government uh, signed a joint venture agreement for Microsoft to supply uh, a new version uh, of Windows 10 to the Chinese government. Imagine that with all of the software package, packages that go with it. Imagine that with all of the inbuilt frontline security that's in it. That package was developed by Microsoft in cooperation with the Ministry of Public Security in China uh, and a, a Chinese partner. But it's not really only reliance on foreign corporations for things like Microsoft Windows. Uh, key national institutions in China, such as the Bank of China, rely on United States corporations like, like IBM to supply complex IT architecture. The, and anyone who knows anything about China and what China's ambitions have been in the last decade, the last two decades, the last seven decades, uh, it's all been about uh, as much independence and self-reliance as possible, but especially uh, in the last decade about indigenization and making Chinese industry as great as it can be. After several years of uh, emphasizing indigenization in the wake of the Edward Snowden uh, revelations, uh, Xi Jinping made a rather remarkable speech in 2016, in which he said that China's core technologies are controlled by foreign corporations. And I really want at the outset, so this is really just by way of introduction, to emphasize how deeply troubling and how deeply disturbing uh, and anxiety creating this set of dependencies are for the Chinese leaders. So all countries have weak cyber defenses. Uh, we have to establish that, I think, um, from the outset. So for example, we know that separate US presidents have declared a national emergency in cyberspace four times since 2015. Uh, the most recent declaration of a national emergency in cyberspace was in March 2020. The United States believes that its cyber defenses are, are weak, but in contrast to China, the United States has a certain degree of confidence that it can maintain some sort of defensive high ground in cyberspace. Uh, that's against the proposition that operations in cyberspace, whether they're offensive or defensive, take place in a very uncertain uh, and rapidly changing environment. But uh, even so, in spite of its great uh, sense of vulnerability in cyberspace, the United States feels relatively confident, especially compared with a country like China, that it can maintain some high ground. So uh, with those notes of introduction behind, I'd just like to give you an overview of the very brief presentation that's coming. I'll review first some more recent evidence of China's cyber defenses. I'll talk about a little more about the evolution of leadership perceptions of China's cybersecurity. Then I'll shift gear a little bit to look at just how the United States recognizes the extent of weakness in China's cyber defenses look at the question of whether they're prepared to shape their policy choices based on that knowledge, and then wrap up with some reflections on whether China's strategic options in a major war with China over Taiwan would be impacted substantially by Chinese perceptions of their weakness in cyberspace. So what's recent evidence of China's weak cyber defenses? So, I mentioned my book published in 2018, which sets out uh, at some detail, in some detail, the case for uh, China having weak cyber defenses. That book focused on uh, some of the bullet points you can see uh, listed below. But I thought I'd just mention uh, by way of update, what sort of information we've found uh, around this question since that book was published. 
So if we look at the quality of cybersecurity education in China uh, in the last two years, what we see is that the reforms instituted beginning in around 2015 are beginning to bite. But the university system in China being as rigid as it is, the number of university lecturers in cybersecurity being finite, uh, and the narrow technical focus of the cybersecurity educators in China all create a situation where the reforms of cybersecurity education that were begun in 2015 as part of China's ambition to become a cyber power, those education reforms, uh, two years after my book was published, five years after they were launched, are still only having modest impact. One of the rather interesting indicators of that um, is in the uh, military sphere. So the, um, uh, one of the PLA universities specializing in uh, information technology, uh, we have information on its uh, enrollments uh, from 2012 right through to uh, 2019. And we can see that the big uptick, uh, big expansion in their numbers of places really only occurred around the 2018, 2019 mark, uh, rather than more consistently in those early years of reform. So it's taken about four or five years for the Chinese education system to get focused uh, and to uh, start to deliver, at least modestly, on the intent of the reforms. Uh, one of the interesting uh, facts about the uh, changes in enrollment numbers in the uh, information uh, university, the PLA, information engineering university, the PLA, is that in 2019, they commenced an undergraduate major in artificial intelligence. There's not too many universities in the world that offer an undergraduate major in artificial intelligence. So that's a quite an interesting sort of reference point. Uh, uh, and it's a, an indicator of the direction they're heading. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they can pick up. What about the quality of cybersecurity research? Well, uh, we find, uh, Pretty much the same picture as um, I could document in uh, 2018. Uh, China is not globally competitive. It's not at the cutting edge of cybersecurity research globally. Now that might, si might sound a little odd, given that uh, China is uh, at the cutting edge of certain technologies in cyberspace, such as quantum communications. Uh, China certainly does have talented researchers in information technology. It does have talented researchers in uh, cybersecurity. But when you look at the uh, quality and output of the universities in China, uh, and we can monitor that extremely in, in extremely fine detail, we can see who the researchers are, we can see what they're publishing, uh, we can see what the balance of their time is spent between uh, research and teaching, uh, and we can see the sorts of impacts and citations that um, uh, go with their published research. And I'll get back to that question of the quality of cybersecurity research when I look at these uh, professional surveys in a moment. One of the really telling signs for the Chinese uh, situation is the situation of its cyber industrial complex. Uh, when we try and understand how big it is and how good it is, uh, we're, uh, we can be quite surprised to find for example, that uh, uh, in 2014, the size of the entire private sector in cybersecurity in China was smaller than the size in terms of um, annual turnover of one United States cybersecurity corporation, brackets the biggest, Symantec. Uh, so um, uh, at, in 2014, the uh, annual turnover of Symantec was 6 billion. Uh, that was a larger number and the annual turnover of all private sector cybersecurity companies in China. And Chinese specialists lament the relative low, relatively low percentage of GDP that cybersecurity companies uh, make to uh, the Chinese uh, economy. But leaving aside my opinions and the conclusions I've been able to draw based on my research, there have now been regular annual surveys by professional groups in China and by cybersecurity companies. And 
the results are consistent um, and for the Chinese, somewhat depressing. Uh, and just to mention, for example, the question of the quality of cybersecurity research, the, there's an annual survey by the Chinese University Alumni Association, which ranks uh, the quality of disciplines in uh, the major universities in China uh, on an eight star basis, sorry, a nine star basis. Uh, and the, in the latest survey, no university in China was judged by the Alumni Association to have world-class research in cybersecurity. No university in China was judged to be the next step below, seven stars. Oh, sorry, two universities were judged to be the next step below, seven stars. In the previous year's survey, no Chinese universities were at seven stars. So according to the Chinese University Alumni Association, Chinese universities are not globally competitive by and large in the field of cybersecurity. And industry surveys of the state of cybersecurity in the private sector and in government in China also produce a rather dismal result. Well, if those sorts of pieces of evidence may, may not be uh, as conclusive as we would like, we can also look at continuing ma major leaks from the Chinese government as evidence that maybe their cybersecurity is not as good as it needs to be. There's been an absolute flood of highly sensitive documents about the repression of Uyghur communities in Xinjiang province. Uh, and while we can't be certain that those documents came uh, from technical surveillance means or from human intelligence means, uh, it's uh, almost a certainty that some of them came through uh, technical collection and cyber espionage. One of the most re amazing leaks was the publication just this year of a threat assessment by the Ministry of State Security in China that the Chinese leaders should probably prepare for war or for armed confrontation with the United States. So continuing leaks um, in any country, whether it's China or the United States, are a good sign of the quality of cybersecurity. So I'll move quickly through the next sets of material I've got, just so that I don't take too much time. Uh, what we uh, have seen in the Chinese case uh, is a gradual escalation in Chinese concerns about cybersecurity in the country. We've all remarked the declaration in 2014 uh, by Xi Jinping that China wanted to become a cyber power. There's two ways of reading that declaration. One is that, well, it goes alongside all of the other declarations about of China's ambition to be a power here and a power there and, and to be at the forefront of all areas of uh, global competition. But another way of reading it is that it reflects the uh, increased awareness because of events between 2010 and 2013 uh, that demonstrated uh, Chinese cybersecurity was desperately weak. And there are a series of incidents, the Snowden leaks, the report by Mandiant on the cyber espionage of the PLA unit demonstrated that one of PLA's premier cyber espionage units couldn't even defend its own cyberspace. Uh, and this uh, United States corporation using unclassified means was able to penetrate it to the core uh, and seriously embarrass, embarrass China as a result. Another consideration is that uh, for the Chinese authorities to maintain the good domestic surveillance that they have over the, their country, if I can use the word good in that sense, it actually depends on the citizens and the corporations having weak cybersecurity. So if China wanted to make sure its whole country was cyber secure, it could do that, but um, that then presents a challenge that it can't uh, undertake the domestic surveillance as well as it would want to. Okay, shifting tack now a little bit to uh, whether or not the United States fully appreciates this weakness. Well, it's hard to know in one sense, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and I've used the phrase to describe this situation that China's cyber defense weaknesses um, are the best kept secret in Washington. So on the one hand, Washington, uh, the national institutions have a vested interest in making uh, China appear uh, 10 feet tall. Uh, they certainly want to hide the, the, the detail of how effectively they can penetrate uh, 
Chinese cyber defences. They certainly don't want to give away to the Chinese uh, the extent to which they're doing that. But what we've seen over the past few years is that uh, the United States government has been prepared to put into the public domain uh, all sorts of detail uh, around these espionage activities. And the Mandiant report uh, in 2013 was actually, uh, what's the word, commissioned may be the wrong word, uh, but it was certainly undertaken with the uh, enthusiastic support of the Pentagon uh, as a way of avoiding the re revelation of intelligence uh, methods and sources. But not long after that, um, the United States government decided that it would have to move more aggressively. And it started putting into the public domain all sorts of revelations, largely through Department of Justice indictments of PLA hackers, uh, all sorts of detail about what had been stolen, when it had been stolen and the like, uh, at the risk of revealing some intelligence uh, methods and sources. And so we, we know that the United States is tracking cyber espionage closely, uh, and the fact that it's doing it openly uh, is, or somewhat openly, is a pretty good uh, indicator that the United States uh, across the board uh, in the key institutions understands just how weak China's cyber defences are. And I think we could make the case that uh, the ramping up of the tech war between the United States and China by the Trump administration, uh, while it has all sorts of drivers and motivations, I think that we're seeing uh, that escalation in part to drive home the strategic advantage that the United States has uh, in this area of capability. We can debate that, I suppose, and look at all the complex nuances around it. But um, I do sense that not only is the escalation of the tension in the United States-China relationship driven by what China is doing in global strategic policy uh, and what it's doing in cyberspace, but I think it's driven by the realization on the United States side that the uh, United States enjoys an advantage and it can exploit that advantage. So if we think about wartime, um, I'm 100% convinced based on uh, what I've read about United States uh, information warfare capabilities, cyber warfare capabilities and plans. I found an interesting uh, statistic, a bit of a factoid, perhaps a little bit unreliable that every year for the past 12 years, the United States Defense Department has spent between $300 billion and $400 billion a year uh, on cyber projects, cyber capabilities. Um, that's 1,000 times more per year than the United States spent in, uh, on things like uh, hypersonic missiles. And in fact, the spending data for cyber uh, in the Pentagon over 12 years at 400 billion is really uh, very different from the spending pattern on hypersonics because it was really only in uh, 2018 that the spending uh, on hypersonics uh, really registered above uh, the negligible. So uh, if we think about the ambitions, the planning and the capabilities of the United States and the imagination that the United States has to attack China in cyberspace, it has a vast array of options at the strategic level. The United States can translate that vast array of broad strategic options uh, in cyberspace for military operations uh, into specific target sets. So we know, for example, that Cyber Command has uh, over 6,000 uh, people working for it. Uh, we know that it's got 133 teams. We know some of those teams work in support of different uh, combatant commands in the United States. So it's quite possible to postulate, because we don't have uh, detailed public domain evidence, but it's quite possible to postulate that some of those teams uh, in Cyber Command and their predecessors before Cyber Command was formed have been developing attack packages uh, against these sorts of targets in China. Uh, Strategic Nuclear Missile Command and Control, CCP and PLA National Communications, Theater Headquarters opposite Taiwan, as a very long list. And if we go back to that original statement um, that I put up on the first slide uh, from the commander of the United States Indo-Pacific Command, uh, 
these are the sorts of targets that, China, that the United States would be selecting to satisfy his ambition to destroy uh, China's strategic command and control uh, and force system collapse in a way that undermined their military capabilities. So the basic conclusion of this presentation is that China's weakness in cyberspace does, shi does shape its options when it comes to a military confrontation with the United States over Taiwan. If the United States does go to war with, Ta with China over Taiwan, we can expect exactly what the commander of Indo-Pacific Command suggested. It will involve large scale use of cyber attacks on military related and war related civil targets. China will want to avoid this at all costs. It will want to keep military operations to a bare minimum. Uh, its main objective will not be to win a military battle with the United States. Its only objective will be to force Taiwan's submission or to force it to retreat from a more extreme separatist course. So in a tense political crisis with the United States, we've got to focus on the proposition that the Chinese goal will not be military victory. The Chinese, Chinese goal will be to force Taiwan submission. Uh, and I think what that suggests to me, perhaps based on the 1979 example, where in the uh, Chinese invasion of Vietnam, China did not use its uh, air force assets partly because they were pretty decrepit, uh, but largely because they knew that the Vietnamese uh, air defences supplied both by the Soviet Union and in part even by China itself uh, would deliver a very sorry uh, defeat to the Chinese uh, air forces. So I really think that the with the United States over Taiwan would really push it to the sorts of uh, instruments that it also disposes. So it can choose among military assets, subversion, sabotage, disruption and political pressure. And I think the Chinese leaders assessment of their own strengths would have them uh, preferably operating much more in the area of subversion, sabotage, disruption and political pressure than in military confrontation with the United States, which would inevitably be punishing for China in cyberspace. Thank you, Tim. That's all I wanted to mention. Greg, thank you very much. Um, that was an intriguing presentation. Um, some of the, some of the things that you you said, um, in fact, you you referred to this yourself, um, might might strike uh, some observers as as almost counterintuitive, um, and I think that's what made your your presentation particularly interesting. That you, I think you 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 challenged. Um, in a in a significant way, some of the assumptions that are widely made about um, China's uh, China's cyber power. Um, so I'm sure we'll come back uh, to that uh, in in the in the debate. But I think you did that in a uh, you did that in a very uh, convincing and, and and stimulating way. So it's a it's a great start. Uh, let's go over to Simone now and uh, hear his views um, and his. And, and his uh, response. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to participate in this seminar to comment on such an interesting and stimulating presentation. Um, I totally agree this presentation was particularly uh, stimulating, I think, because it somehow contradicts um, a, a mainstream view that we can see, at least in the, main, in the, in the Western media, regarding China and China's place in the cyber domain. Uh, the mainstream view in the Western media, or at least in the European media, being that China uh, has an advantage in the cyber domain and that China would be ready to use this advantage in the cyber domain in its competition with the United States. And in general, the idea that the cyber domain is a domain where weaker actors have an advantage, a structural advantage over stronger actors. Uh, non-state actors have an advantage over state actors, 
uh, rising powers have an advantage over the hegemon. So there is this idea of the cyber domain as a domain where the, 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 the weak actors have an advantage. So uh, what I would like to do in my comments is, is to further add to this idea that this is not necessarily the case, uh, by comparing these uh, uh, Western uh, uh, mainstream discourse, mainstream at least in, in the media, with Chinese perceptions, with the, Chinese, with the perceptions of Chinese analysts, uh, based on the analysis that I did for, for research I've been working on, uh, of a, a Chinese authoritative publication, the uh, Wofan Kezi, uh, um, um, Sci um, Science and Technology for National Defense, uh, the journal of the uh, Wofan Kezi Dasu, the, Nash, the National University of Defense Technology, uh, a PLA university that is focused with research on research and training in the application of science and technology to the military to the military field. So I will try to show that this Western mainstream discourse does not correspond to the perception in China, um, exactly as Greg Austin just uh, just explained in his presentation. Um, so first of all, um, these Western mainstream discourse that we see in the media. The idea that cyber weapons are the weapons of the weak um, is based on two main assumptions, I think. Uh, the first assumption is that the barriers to entry in the cyber domain are particularly low. Uh, barriers to entry are low if compared to other domains of military competition, to domains of traditional military competition. Uh, cyber weapons are cheap if compared to um, um, conventional weapons, but also to nuclear weapons. Um, and the development of cyber weapons is uh, um, uh, made easier by the dual use nature of technology. So the, the fact that the same technology that is used for civilian purposes can also be used uh, for military purposes. So low barriers to entry in the cyber domain that make it possible for uh, a wide range of actors to develop cyber weapons. Uh, on the second hand, the second assumption is that uh, uh, strong actors are somehow more vulnerable to cyber attacks than weak actors uh, because strong actors are um, economically more advanced, uh, socially more developed. So first of all, the militaries of strong actors um, um, are more vulnerable because they are more dependent on networks. Uh, militaries that have undergone the revolution in military affairs, the so-called revolution in military affairs, uh, depend heavily on uh, uh, information and communication technology, depend on networks, and this makes them more vulnerable to cyber attacks if compared to backward militaries, to militaries of, um, of, other, of other states, of developing states, for example. Uh, but it's not just the military that is more uh, dependent on networks and hence more vulnerable to cyber attacks, it is society at large, um, complex societies, developed economies, uh, depend on networks for, for some key functions. And these may, for example, transportation, energy, financial services, and all of these makes them more uh, uh, vulnerable to cyber attacks than uh, less developed society and less developed economies. Um, so based on these two assumptions, the low barriers to enter of the cyber domain and the greater vulnerability of strong actors due to their dependence on network, there is this idea in this uh, um, uh, discourse of the media, of the Western media, that weak actors are better placed at taking advantage of the cyber domain against stronger actors. This is the case with non-state actors such as terrorist groups, but this is also the case with uh, um, rising powers. And so when, when, um, uh, when we talk about China in this discourse, there's always the idea that China is better placed, somehow structurally better placed um, than the US at taking advantages um, of, of, of the cyber domain in the competition with the United States as the established hegemon. Um, so this is the perception in the Western media. However, if we look at the debate among Chinese analysts, um, the perception is completely different um, as, uh, and, and it is the perception of the Chinese inferiority in the cyber domain um, as uh, Greg Austin has just explained in his presentation. So I will elaborate a little bit on this, on the perception of Chinese analysts based on this specific uh, journal, Wufan Kezi, and the articles, the dozens of articles that have been published on, uh, on the cyber domain in general uh, 
on this journal, in this journal, over the past 15 years, more or less. So if we go back to the two assumptions in the Western discourse, uh, the barriers to entry and the, vulner the relative vulnerability of, of weak and strong actors, the perception um, uh, by Chinese analysts is quite different from the Western one. First of all, barriers to entry. Uh, um, Chinese analysts um, agree with uh, the Western discourse that barriers to entry in the cyber domain are low, uh, or at least they are low if compared to other domains, uh, other traditional domains of military competition, as uh, argued by one Chinese analyst in these, uh, in these articles, for example, cyber weapons have low costs and high returns. So cyber weapons are cheap to produce and very effective, can be used very effectively, can, can produce significant strategic uh, effects. And also for Chinese analysts, uh, the dual use nature um, of, the, uh, of the technology involved in cyber attacks makes it easier to develop such weapons also for weaker actors. Uh, however, the main difference with the Western discourse here um, is that according to Chinese analysts, the fact that the barriers to entry are low does not necessarily mean that the cyber domain is a level playing field. So more actors are able to enter the cyber domain if compared to other domains, but then once entered in the cyber domain, not all actors are equally effective in using the cyber domain and taking advantage of the cyber domain. Because according to Chinese analysts, uh, the gaps in the economic, scientific, and technological level of development of different actors still have a major impact on their capabilities in the cyber domain, on their ability to use the cyber domain effectively. So um, from this point of view, uh, all the articles published in GoFunkG insist on the fact that the US still controls core technologies um, in the cyber domain, uh, that the, um, um, the US has so-called monopolistic dominance over some of the core technologies in the cyber domain. Um, and this leads uh, um, automatically to a US superiority in the cyber domain. So this issue of the superiority of the US in the cyber domain is central to all Chinese discussions of uh, the cyber domain and the use of the cyber domain, at least in this journal, the journal that I anal analyze, Guofang uh, This superiority is often qualified as absolute, so so absolute superiority, which is a very strong meaning in the Chinese uh, um, strategic language. Also, if we go back to the uh, strategic tradition of uh, Chinese military thought. If we go back to Mao, the, the concept of absolute uh, superiority is a very strong concept. Other analysts qualify this superiority as general superiority, comprehensive superiority, strategic superiority. In any case, the idea that the US has an advantage, a superiority in the cyber domain is, um, is, is very clear in any of these, uh, uh, of these articles. Uh, and this superiority, then leads to what Chinese analysts call uh, a US internet hegemony, one law patch man. So the idea that in the, um, in the uh, cyber domain, the US is the hegemon. So exactly as in any other domain of military competition. So in this respect, according to Chinese analysts, there, are, there is no significant difference between the, um, the, the cyber domain and other domains, traditional domains. Uh, the US is, is the hegemon also in the cyber domain, exactly as in other domains of military competition. So in this context, uh, according to the Chinese analysts, uh, China remains structurally at disadvantage. Um, China has made progress in some areas, in the areas where, according to the analysts, uh, China has the advantage of the follower, enjoys the advantage of the follower. Examples that are mentioned are um, the global positioning systems or supercomputers. But in general, overall, China remains a disadvantage in, this, in, in the cyber domain. Um, and in the cyber domain conceived in a comprehensive way. So Chinese analysts are very careful in uh, um, emphasizing that the cyber domain should be uh, understood as a comprehensive domain which includes uh, the military dimension, but also political, economy, and cultural dimension. So the cyber domain should be looked at as a comprehensive domain. And in this comprehensive domain, China is clearly at disadvantage. This is the perception. So this uh, regarding the first assumption, the low barriers to entry. Uh, 
According to Chinese analysts, barriers to entry are low, but this does not mean that all actors are equal in the cyber domain. The US, as a country that has the monopoly over core technology, remains in a position of superiority. And in fact, the gap between the US and China is not closing, but it is becoming bigger. It is growing. Then the second assumption, uh, the assumption that uh, um, uh, in the Western discourse, strong actors are more vulnerable to cyber attacks than weak actors, and hence uh, the US is somehow more vulnerable to cyber attacks than China itself. Also in this case, the starting point is more or less the same. So Chinese analysts are also aware um, that due to their greater dependence on networks, developed economies, um, advanced uh, economies are more, uh, are, are more vulnerable to cyber attacks. They are aware that this is true for the militaries of strong uh, countries because uh, the militaries that underwent the um, um, revolution in military affairs depend highly on information and communication technology. And they are aware that this is true for society at large because uh, some of the critical infrastructures in advanced economies um, rely on networks. Uh, and so by uh, attacking those networks, it is possible to um, uh, to, to, to create uh, a collapse of significant sectors uh, of the economy. Uh, some of the uh, Chinese analysts uh, um, uh, talk about the new form of warfare that they define information and infrastructure warfare that is a form of warfare focused on the use of cyber attacks against critical infrastructures. So the starting point is the same. But then again, the perception of China's place in the cyber domain is significantly different from the Western discourse because Chinese analysts insist on the fact that China is also vulnerable to this kind of warfare. That due to the uh, rapid economic development of China over the past three, four decades, uh, China has also become extremely vulnerable to cyber attacks because it has become increasingly uh, dependent on networks. Um, uh, the focus here is on the so-called uh, uh, informatization and internetization of some key sectors of the Chinese economy, in particular the financial, transportation of, and energy sectors. So according to Chinese analysts, the informatization and internetization in these sectors creates new vulnerabilities for China. And in this respect, China is not less vulnerable than the United States. China is at least as vulnerable as the United States in this respect. Um, there is, however, an additional layer of vulnerability in the case of China, if compared to the United States, that is the result of China's dependence on imported technology. This is another point that is very clear in all of these articles. It is, this is one of the key topics in these articles. The idea that greater vulnerability comes with uh, reliance on imported technology. Um, um, so um, there is the idea that China um, is still dependent on imports um, of some core products, uh, information technology core products. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, the perception in China is that the, um, the US still has monopolistic dominance over the, the core uh, technology um, products. And um, concern um, are raised in particular with the fact that not just private companies uh, rely on imported um, uh, technology, but also the government and even the military. So this is openly stated in these articles. It is openly identified as a key vulnerability of China. Um, and uh, um, um, this reliance on imported technology makes it more difficult for China to protect its networks because as uh, argued by one analyst, installing security products and protection measures on platforms developed by others is like building a tower on shifting sand. So reliance on foreign technology makes it more difficult to protect networks. Uh, so also in this respect, when it comes to the vulnerability, to the uh, bigger vulnerability of strong actors, the starting point in this is the same if compared to the Western discourse, strong actors are in fact more vulnerable to cyber attacks than weak actors. But on the one hand, China um, uh, uh, through its development has also become more dependent on networks and hence more vulnerable to cyber attacks. And on the other hand, if compared to the United States, China has an additional layer of vulnerability that is the reliance on imported technology. So if we look at both the, the, the assumptions, the uh, bar, lower barriers to enter in the cyber domain and the greater vulnerability of strong actors to cyber attacks, the view in China is considerably different uh, 
from the view in, in the Western debate, in the, in the Western discourse, in the media, at least in the media. And this is very much reflected, this different view in China is very much reflected in the awareness of the leadership uh, regarding China's position in, in, in the cyberspace, as, as Greg Austin just mentioned in, in, in his presentation and as he uh, detailed in his presentation. And uh, um, just one final comment. In this respect, the, the speech that uh, was just mentioned, the one by Xi Jinping in 2016, uh, at the Cybersecurity and Informatization World Conference was very important because uh, um, in the, the um, um, control exercised by other powers on Internet core technologies was explicitly identified as a key vulnerability. And the solution to this un un vulnerability that was proposed was the um, um, so-called correctly handling the relationship between opening and autonomy, which in terms of, of policy means on the one hand continuing to import the technology that China needs, but at the same time doing this in order to become autonomous, to produce autonomous technology with the ultimate goal of autonomous innovation. And um, I will stop here for now. Thank you. Simone, thank you very much. <clears throat> That was great. What you what you said, I think, perfectly complemented what what Greg had said. First of all, in that um, you looked at this issue from a uh, from a, uh, a Chinese perspective using Chinese sources, and uh, you you highlighted these um, uh, 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 Chinese perspectives on the the two assumptions that are made by uh, many Western observers about the the low barriers to entry um, and secondly the assumption that strong actors are, are more vulnerable that was that was really great thank you very much um, so between you uh, you you have held our audience uh, very well uh, we uh, we have around um, 70 participants online uh, I I'd like now to uh, move into the discussion session um, and we'll look for, for questions uh, from our audience. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question uh, and you're uh, watching this webinar, um, look, at the, uh, look at the instruction slide which has uh, just gone up um, and you can, uh, you can essentially ask a question in two ways. You can, you can raise your hand um, uh, which will show me a little blue icon and then I can uh, identify you to ask your question live or you can write your question using the question and answer function and I see that two people have sent in written questions already um, we don't I don't see any blue hands amongst the participants yet but I'll keep my eye on that um, so let's turn to the written questions first of all. Um, we have a question from Tedman Getchman, and it's uh, about the capability of China to uh, implement internal censorship in the event of um, internal disturbances in China. Um, and also related to that, how capable is the US of um, having an impact on China's ability to implement internal censorship? So uh, internal censorship um, in, a, in a cyber sense. Uh, so I'd like to give each of you the chance to respond to that. Greg. Thanks, Tim. I think they're both challenging questions in their own way, perhaps um, apparently a little distant from the main theme of the presentation, but as both questioners would appreciate, fully linked um, because the apparatus which is involved in delivering cybersecurity in China is the apparatus that's involved in delivering censorship and the two processes are quite intimately linked. Uh, I think that this is an open question. Uh, the we saw through the COVID exercise that the uh, Chinese government was in a, unable to control popular uh, expressions uh, 
we saw that there were independent reporters uh, going about the streets of Wuhan, for example, documenting uh, various uh, activities on the streets and in the hospitals. Uh, and we even had the rather uh, depressing uh, site that, um, or event that the Shanghai Laboratory, uh, which shared with the world on the 10th of January, the genome for the uh, COVID virus was closed down uh, one or two days later uh, by the central authorities for rectification. Uh, so the COVID uh, crisis, which was in China, largely contained to a few areas, uh, demonstrated really uh, a willingness of Chinese citizens um, on a small scale and Chinese uh, elites on a small scale to operate independently of the government control mechanisms. The reason why the lab in Shanghai was uh, closed down uh, was almost certainly because it was conflicting with the ambitions of the Chinese central government to control the flow of information it wasn't because of what they said. It was that they must have done something uh, which um, didn't sit well with the uh, controlling agencies. And the same with reporters on the streets and the doctors. Uh, my view is that the Chinese government wanted the knowledge of the coronavirus um, to be dealt with in a serious and, and responsible way, but the last thing it wanted was independent reporters going about their business. That's a long way of saying that in a crisis that really only affected a very small percentage of China's population uh, directly, uh, we saw a loss of control. So uh, the Chinese government displays a sense of vulnerability about control. So its reaction to the terrorist attacks by allegedly Muslim perpetrators across China over several years that has led to this um, depressingly inhuman uh, concentration camp approach in Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Um, so I certainly think that the Chinese capability um, is vulnerable, uh, that control capability is vulnerable in a major public disturbance across the country. Uh, and I think that the Chinese leaders feel that it's, um, that they're vulnerable. That's about all I could usefully say, I think, um, for today. Thank you very much, Greg. Simone? Um, yes, uh, based on the, on the articles that I analyzed on Wofan Kriji, this is also the perception, a perception of vulnerability also in this respect. So as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the cyber domain is conceived by the Chinese analysts as a comprehensive domain that includes the military dimension, the economic dimension, but also the political and cultural dimension. And in fact, the political and cultural dimension is a key dimension, according to Chinese, uh, to Chinese analysts. And there is a perception of a vulnerability in this respect too. Um, uh, this is a long, st long, um, long standing concern in China, uh, the idea of what is called peaceful evolution, um, uh, the idea that uh, um, Western values can be somehow instilled from outside to promote uh, uh, domestic subversion. And the, the, the cyber domain has been identified um, since the beginning as a key uh, domain where these kinds of activities might be, might be conducted. And the perception here is that China is vulnerable in this respect, extremely vulnerable in this respect. So um, in the articles uh, that I analyze, this is a central concern. So the vulnerability, not only from a military point of view, but also from a general political point of view, uh, and there is a lot of emphasis on the need for the Chinese authorities to strengthen control um, over, the, over the internet from this point of view. So uh, I agree with the idea that China perceives itself as vulnerable also in this respect. So in Europe, we, we often tend, especially at these times, to look at China as a potential source of uh, information operations in uh, European public opinions. But in fact, China perceives itself as exposed to this kind of, of danger and very vulnerable to this. Thank you very much. Um, we now have a question from an, uh, an anonymous uh, participant um, who's asked a, who's asked a, uh, a rather larger question um, about China's growing cyber capabilities and whether they're um, an indication of sophistication um, 
And also, if, if China is investing in cyber offense, um, it, would be, it would be strange if it was also neglecting cyber defense, wouldn't it? So it's a, um, this is a, 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 a big picture question. Simone? Yes. Um, well, in China, as in the West, I think there is the idea uh, that in the cyber domain, uh, defending is extremely difficult. And so the best way to defend oneself is to attack somehow. So um, there is somehow the idea that uh, defend, defense um, as such is more difficult to achieve. And so a lot of uh, efforts have to be made to develop offensive capabilities as well. Offensive capabilities as a way to achieve some defensive potential, let's say. Um, and so in China, in, in the, the uh, articles that I analyzed, there is also this uh, idea that the best uh, defense in the cyber domain is offense and that somehow the emphasis on the development of offensive capabilities is also a way of defending. Um, also, there is the idea that the United States itself is investing in offensive capabilities as a way of supporting its uh, uh, defense in the cyber domain. There is the idea that the US, um, although it is the militarily most powerful actor in the world, it is also unable to defend itself uh, um, adequately uh, in the cyber domain and has thus to rely on offense more than on defense. So there is this emphasis on offense in, in, the, in, in the articles that I analyzed, uh, there is this emphasis on offense uh, as a way to defend, to defend also in, 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 some, in some way. Um, and in fact, it is really coherent with the tradition of Chinese strategic thought, because uh, the idea of um, uh, resorting to let's say, offensive tactics and operations within the context of a defensive strategy is really a tradition of China's um, uh, military doctrine, of the PLA military doctrine, and, and of, the, of the Chinese strategic tradition going back at least to the, to the, the years of the Revolutionary War. So this is coherent. This interpretation of the peculiarities of the cyber domain is somehow coherent with the strategic tradition of the PLA. Uh. Thank you very much. I've got quite a few questions coming in now. So rather than um, asking uh, each of you to give your, your response to every question, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, give each question to, uh, to one of you uh, in the hope of um, being able to uh, secure responses to as many of them as possible. I've got a, uh, uh, a question from Victor Cheng. And uh, this is for Greg. Um, given that the Chinese military has a tradition of being able to uh, improvise in combat, how likely is it that they could surprise the West uh, using, using their locally developed uh, uh, high-tech during a cyber war? Well, again, a very interesting question. Uh... At a tactical level, I think that uh, surprise of that kind would be expected. So, for example, uh, if we were in the uh, midst of, a, of a, an all-out war between the United States and China, I think that the Chinese government would not feel too many inhibitions about a local commander exercising that sort of um, initiative. Uh, the tendency, I think, however, in certainly in the United States case, has been over centralization of offensive cyber operations, uh, which has only been diluted uh, between say uh, 2012 and 2018 in official documents and in activities. Uh, in China, the picture is uh, somewhat unclear, but um, I'd like to link it perhaps to that question about sophistication in the PLA um, as they develop these various capabilities. The Ability of um, a single highly motivated and highly skilled hacker to do severe damage should not be underestimated. But I think we have to sort of, in a sense, try and get a sense of the degree to which sophisticated cyber capabilities can be spread throughout the PLA. So we're in a situation in the United States where with high levels of um, technical education, a highly developed cyber industrial complex, 
uh, and uh, lots of uh, talent, uh, both homegrown and um, immigrant in the United States. And we compare that with China. Um, so in the United States, they even have problem disseminating cyber military technologies throughout their armed forces. Uh, in China, which started much later, uh, the opportunity for formed units in the country, say perhaps um, an army unit or a theater command uh, undertaking unscripted uh, cyber operations uh, against United States forces uh, arriving in Taiwan or preparing to deploy to Taiwan. Um, I think those opportunities are going to be very few and far between, um, at least in the immediate future. I think that the situation um, in 10 years time may be very different, but I think we'd want to see uh, a continuation of the reforms we have seen in the PLA in the last few years. Uh, we would want to see much greater intrusion of serious cyber warfighting technologies into the PLA education institutions. We want to see a much more serious spread of that than we have. And we'd want to see much deeper evidence, although evidence is going to be hard to find. I think we want to see much more evidence of uh, these PLA units being able to uh, undertake uh, structured strategically or operationally significant cyber operations um, on an independent basis. So uh, it's certainly something to watch and to collect against. I think it's um, the sort of question uh, which uh, can go to a list of about 10 or 20, which we really need to start collecting against and analyzing. So thanks for the question. Uh, it's certainly added to my list. So thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, this next question is for Simone. Um, do you, do you, it, it's not specific, it, it, it's not asked specifically for you, it's that I'm directing it uh, towards you, Simone. Um, do, do you believe that the uh, hostility towards Huawei involvement in the 5G networks of various countries is driven uh, more by concern about China uh, trying to embed offensive technology within uh, the systems of potential opponents, or is it more concerned with Huawei uh, uh, being uh, used as a vector for gathering intelligence uh, in order to build China's own cyber capabilities? Sorry, you're, you're yes. muted, I think. Sorry, sorry. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting and complicated question. And the answer to this question is, in fact, very important for future development. Um, I don't have an answer. I have a perception that is maybe a European perception, a perception based on the case of, based on the European debate on the issue uh, of Huawei involvement of 5G in general. Uh, and also on the Italian debate, as you might know, Italy is one of the countries that signed a BRI memorandum with China. Um, and that is somehow at the forefront of this debate regarding relations with China, cooperation with China in this sector as well. Um, I think uh, in the case of the European countries, at, at least, this debate has very much to do with broader political considerations regarding the international alignments. So the debate that we are seeing in Europe, and especially in the case of Italy, um, is not really a technical debate, is often not really a technical debate <clears throat> on the technology itself and the risk associated with the technology, or with the involvement of one uh, um, uh, actor or another actor uh, in the development of the technology, but it's really related to how we place ourselves as Europeans and as individual European countries in this very complicated, broader political context of the um, uh, tensions between the United States and China. So there is, of course, a component of the debate that has to do with the risks, with the technical risk associated with the development of the technology and the involvement of the Chinese, of Chinese companies in the development of the, of the technology. But I think that most of the debate really revolves on the political implications um, and this makes this debate, I would say, much more difficult and much more complicated. This makes this issue much more complicated to, to solve because it's some, uh, solving this issue uh, 
uh, sometimes requires solving a broader strategic issue of what's the position of the European countries and of my country in particular in this evolving international context. So I think this is a very complicated issue where you have a technical component on the one hand, but they cannot be separated from political and strategic considerations that are also very important and make everything much more difficult to debate and to, and to decide on. Thank you very much. Uh, great. Um, Greg, uh, question for you from Elijah Bookley. Uh, according to Michael Beckley, it's almost impossible for China to attack Taiwan uh, with a conventional invasion force. As such, uh, China's only available means for attacking Taiwan, for example, if Taiwan was to declare independence, is with a cyber attack. However, China would not want to get into a cyber war with the US, uh, which, has, which has promised, uh, the US has promised to aid Taiwan in the event of a conflict. So the question is, how would China launch a cyber attack on Taiwan uh, without involving the US? Well, thank you, Tim, and thank you, Elijah, for the question. I think it's a, a very useful one. Uh, it takes us, I think, into what you call gray operations. Uh, there are a range of ways in which China would definitely consider using cyber attacks against Taiwan outside of the military domain. Uh, so the uh, Chinese understanding of modern uh, processes of subversion and political influence uh, definitely involve all sorts of offensive cyber operations. And we've seen those already uh, in play in a variety of countries. Uh, and in the case of China's operations in Taiwan, we can imagine that they're very highly developed. Uh, the, uh, so, so I guess I'd make the first part of the, my answer will be to make a very clear distinction between uh, engagement with the armed forces of the United States in cyberspace uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the question of uh, really engaging civil and political targets um, in Taiwan. But I think the second part of my question would go to the, the uh, proposition that China's United Front Department is not the most dangerous of the Chinese organizations when it comes to uh, international political influence um, and, uh, and subversion. The Ministry of State Security is far more powerful and far more dangerous and far more worrisome. In the case of Taiwan, uh, what, we, what has almost certainly been the case uh, is that China has been planting fifth columnists uh, in Taiwan uh, for many years. Uh, it already had a range of political supporters in Taiwan uh, in terms of people who support one country, two systems, or sorry, one China, uh, I should say, more correctly. Uh, so China has this sort of natural base of supporters uh, in Taiwan who uh, believe in reunification in some way very strongly but in, on top of that, the Ministry of State Security has almost certainly been sending hundreds, if not thousands, of immigrants, um, short-term people, into Taiwan to uh, act as a fifth column in the event of a political crisis, to act as provocateurs uh, in a political crisis. And the, uh, we know this um, partly based on our understanding of Chinese history, but the Ministry of State Security did it in the case of Hong Kong um, in the... Uh, approach uh, to 1997. It's well documented in the PhD thesis by a student of mine at the um, Australian National University. Uh, so that, uh, so cyber attacks, yes, uh, widespread, highly damaging uh, in a confrontation with Taiwan, but very much politically directed uh, and very much, if my original hypothesis is right, uh, avoiding uh, the military sphere as much as possible. And I, I think that uh, most people would agree that China can do severe damage to Taiwan uh, politically uh, in terms of social cohesion um, and response capability through uh, cyber attacks coupled with political subversion and political influencing um, in a major crisis, um, which is one reason, uh, again, why the Chinese wouldn't, have to, wouldn't necessarily reach first engagement with US military forces in cyberspace. 
Thank you. Greg, thanks very much. Um, we, I've got quite a, quite a number of written questions here. Could I remind those who are uh, participating uh, in the webinar that you, you can also ask a question by, by putting your hand up and then you can ask the question uh, live. It would be nice to have some live questions uh, as well as the, the written ones. Um, but reverting to the written questions for Simone, um, this is from Hon Min Yao. Uh, Hon Min says, uh, thanks, thanks to the two speakers for their inspiring talks. Um, I think no country can be um, self-contented with their cyber capability. Um, and the, the Chinese domestic literature that, um, that you, you spoke to, Simone, um, uh, reflects that, that, that general trend. Um, but uh, if China is so concerned with its vulnerability, um, why does China continue to conduct offensive cyber activities abroad? Because surely those contradict the argument um, and it can also be a sort of invitation for China's enemies to react with cyber means. So maybe... Um, the, the, the critical um, academic reflections that, that you referred to, Simone, could be, uh, maybe they can't be interpreted as the, as the mainstream or official uh, Chinese perception of their capabilities. Um, maybe they, they don't really um, uh, show what China's uh, likely behavior is. So someone is uh, pushing back a little bit, Simone, at, at, um, at how seriously we should, uh, we should take um, those articles uh, in the literature that you referred to as, a, as an indication of, of China's genuine self-perceptions of its capability. What's your view on that? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, the, the, the journal that I analyzed is not exactly an academic journal. It's something in the middle because it is published by an academic institution, but it is an academic institution affiliated to the PLA. And most of the articles that I analyzed are written uh, either by researchers in military institutions, such as the, uh, the National University of Defense Technology itself or the Chinese uh, Academy of Military Sciences or other research institutions, institutions of the PLA, or even uh, they are even affiliated to PLA units. So from this point of view, this publication is in the middle between an academic uh, journal, uh, which covers different topics, of, of course, not just uh, uh, topics related to the cyber domain, but also uh, to, 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 in general to the application of science and technology to the military field. So on the one hand, it's, uh, it's in the middle between an academic publication, but then uh, a publication that somehow represents the views of people um, who work within the PLA. So I, I don't think this is the academic debate. There are other uh, outlets for academic debate in China on these topics uh, where the views might be a little bit different. Um, but then regarding the question um, itself, uh, um, I think the two things are not necessarily in contradiction. So as I, as I said earlier, there is the idea in China, but not only in China, there is an idea that is very clear also in the West, that in the cyber domain, it's basically impossible to defend and that the best way to defend is through offensive uh, operations. So the fact that on the one hand, uh, the Chinese, uh, um, the community of Chinese analysts present China as vulnerable does not contradict the fact that China might resort to uh, operations uh, that we might define as offensive operations, because in fact, uh, um, this is identified as a potential response to the vulnerability itself. So the, um, uh, the, the fact that defending is a difficult task might in fact lead to more offensive operations. And again, this is not just in the Chinese debate. This is typical also of part of the, of the Western debate on, on, on this technology. There is this idea that in this domain, in the cyber domain, due to technological reasons, it's not feasible to defend and emphasis should be placed on the offense. This is um, somehow, this reminds of the debate on air power in the early stages in the 1920s and 30s, when there was also the idea that this new technology um, did not allow for defenses and the only possible defense was offense. So there are interesting um, mm. common elements between the two debates. Uh. 
Uh, very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Greg, there's a question from David Mussington here. Uh, does China accept any developing concepts for constraining norms on the resort to cyber effects in warfare? Specifically, are there any norm-based reasons to expect China to adopt self-restraint due to international legal principles? Well, thanks, uh, Tim, and thanks for the question. Uh, there are not a lot of reference points around how the military uh, views these questions, uh, but there is one important uh, reference point, and that is not long after the UN group of governmental experts in 2015 agreed a long list of possible voluntary norms, basically for peacetime, the, uh, within uh, several months, uh, both Russia and China walked away from that consensus. Uh, now, that's my assessment. Uh, we can find all sorts of Chinese official statements which may contradict that assessment. But um, I heard it said from a military source um, in China that um, the PLA was not happy with the 2015 GGE consensus because the Ministry of uh, National Defence and the PLA were not consulted. Now, I find that statement that they were not consulted almost impossible to believe, um, but I guess it probably means they were not consulted as fully as they wanted to be consulted. And um, from other information from uh, other sources, uh, it appears that the China only signed up to the 2015 GGE consensus uh, under some pressure from Russia to do so. Uh, and I guess the proposition that the Russians put to the Chinese was, well, you've got nothing to lose uh, because they're peacetime norms, they're voluntary norms, they're possible norms. Um, you're not signing up for anything. Uh, uh, but in fact, I do think that the, uh, uh, and you can find several statements in PLA journals today and PLA statements today or in the recent past where they talk about the uncertainty of international norms in cyberspace. Uh, the uh, and certainly for wartime. So I'm sorry that I don't have a detailed answer. I'm sorry that I can't reference uh, PLA sources talking positively about the constraining effects of norms um, on cyber operations. Um, so perhaps um, certainly um, there may be other people who can answer that more effectively than I. Uh, but um, I don't think the PLA is desperately interested in an international conversation around constraints in cyberspace through norm making. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Simone, would you like to follow up with any response on that? Um, I don't have specific elements on this topic, so, uh, but I found very interesting what, uh, what Greg said about the, the consultations and of the PLA and the Ministry of National Defense in the negotiations. It is very interesting and um, I mean, it would say a lot about the way how China approaches this kind of negotiations. So the, the involvement of all the actors um, that have uh, uh, responsibilities in this field is of course crucial uh, when it comes to negotiations. And if something in the decision-making process is not working properly, then it's going to have a major impact on the negotiations uh, themselves. But yeah, on the question itself, I don't have any element. So thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, Here's a question for you, Simone. Um, uh, and this is from Robert Millard. Uh, a dialogue is emerging about the potential of quantum computing to create comprehensive cyber superiority for powers with access to that technology. Hence, something of an arms race between the US and China is developing in this area. What is the likelihood of this becoming a reality in the foreseeable future. I think what Robert means is the, um, the, what, is the what is the likelihood of quantum com computing creating comprehensive cyber superiority? Um, well, from a technical point of view, I don't have elements to, to um, respond on the prospects uh, and uh, on whether the, um, this is going to change, to dramatically change um, the, 
the, the current situation in the cyber domain. But of, um, China is investing a lot on these. And I think that from this point of view, if we look at the investments that are being made in this field, there is already a very clear pattern of competition between the United States and China in this field. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, um, this is identified in China as a sector where China might have some sort of advantage of the follower. This is a sector where, China, where the Chinese analysts, who in general perceive China's position as rather vulnerable in the cyber domain, this is a sector where they see China as better placed than in other sectors. So this is a sector where they see China as making important progress. So this is a sector where China is investing a lot and it is identified by the Chinese analysts as very important for the, for the future, also in the, in the case of the competition with the US. So from the point of view of China, that's for sure, this is for sure going to, to be a major, um, a, a major field of competition with the United States. Thank you. Greg, um, Alex Stone has asked an interesting question, which I'll paraphrase uh, slightly, and I hope he'll excuse me for, for doing this. Um, he asks if uh, China's offensive cyber capability is, is strong enough uh, for the threat of it to deter middle powers from exploiting China's relatively weak cyber defenses. Is there some recognition of mutual vulnerability? Well, that's an excellent question. Well, there's many um, ways to answer. I guess, sorry, Finn, go ahead. Yeah, Greg, I was just, I was just going to say, um, immediately on reading that question, the, um, the, the recent reports of the um, supposed Vietnamese cyber attack uh, on, on China in, in connection with uh, intelligence gathering on COVID-19 uh, struck me as perhaps relevant um, as an instance of a, of a, of a medium power uh, perhaps not being deterred by China's offensive capabilities. Sure. I, you know, there's several ways really to get into the question. I, one immediately way in, one immediate way in is that um, uh, China has not conducted too many retaliatory attacks in cyberspace for cyber intrusions. So we can't see that pattern uh, clearly. We know that um, uh, China was engaged in progressively more aggressive cyber espionage against the United States from 2003 to 2013. Uh, we know that in 2013, the United States delivered an ultimatum to the Chinese to stop it. Uh, and as a result, over several years, we arrived at the uh, persistent engagement and cyber deterrence initiative from the United States. Um, many middle powers, so according to one diplomatic source, there are 22 countries in the world which have endorsed the United States policy of persistent engagement and actively participate in it, which means diplomatic confrontations with China over its cyber espionage activities. And in some cases, uh, by the more capable cyber powers, it involves active participation in cyber uh, attacks of some sort against Chinese targets. Uh, now, uh, I think the, rec the historical record is a bit slim. Um, you know, the strategic and geopolitical context around use of cyberspace by middle powers towards a country like China, you know, are, are highly undeveloped. So it's early days. Um, uh, certainly, um, it's another one of those issues which as we get deeper and deeper into the cyber age, uh, we need to appreciate. Uh, take, for example, the country of Australia. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, they've reached the point where they're prepared to join the United States in the Persistent Engagement Initiative, the Cyber Deterrence Initiative. They've publicly declared that they've undertaken all sorts of offensive, or a range of offensive operations against Islamic State. Um, it's hard to believe that they haven't also undertaken some sort of retaliatory activity or active defense activity against Chinese agencies. So I think there's not a feeling among too many countries that they're afraid of China in cyberspace. If that answers the question, thanks. Microphone. Yes. Thank you very much. That was a very good answer to Greg. Um, Alex, Alex W. Um, 
asks, uh, and this one is for Simone, uh, he, uh, he says, do you think that the current US-China trade war uh, will increase China's appetite to invest in the US tech and cybersecurity sector, or will it act as an even greater barrier? Well, this is a very interesting and difficult question. Um, the situation is, is uh, rapidly evolving, so it's really difficult to say the kinds of barriers that will be introduced and how this will impact on the behavior of the different actors involved. So I, I really don't know the case of the US, but I think this will increase for sure China's interest, at least in the European, in the European market. So I think, again, with a European perspective, I think there might be an interest uh, in, uh, by, by Chinese companies to invest in Europe. And again, also in this case, we have to see how the um, evolution of the political situation in general uh, will impact on these, whether new restrictions will be introduced, whether the political climate will evolve in a way that it will make uh, politically unfeasible uh, to have this sort of investments. But uh, yes, I think there is a growing interest, uh, at least in the case of Europe. I don't know whether the, the United States, and I don't know whether this is going to be feasible considering the, the, the evolving situation. And if I may, uh, just a comment on the previous question, because this, oh. uh, this was one of the issues that I was looking at when I was analyzing the articles in Bocancoji, because in the West, there is the, this discourse on uh, cyber um, weapons as a weapon of the week. So I was also curious about Chinese view regarding the, the threats, the potential threats posed by actors that are weaker than China. So whether Chinese analysts consider cyber a weapon that might be used by weaker actors against China. And I was quite surprised to find that nothing of these appears in the articles that I analyzed. So I was also expecting to, to find some comments on some, or, or some ideas regarding, for example, countries in Southeast Asia uh, that are involved in disputes with China, but there's basically no discussion about these. There are some references, for example, to Japan and South Korea that are identified as uh, countries that are technologically more developed than China, uh, but there is no real discussion regarding uh, countries such as Vietnam or other countries in Southeast Asia, which was quite surprising for me. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we haven't got time uh, to um, get responses from you um, to all the questions. There are still some uh, left over, um, but but we do have uh, a minute or two for one final question. This is from Mari Jared. And Mari asks, um, do you have an understanding of the ultimate goal of the Chinese Communist Party in the cyber domain? Uh, is it more concerned with keeping its own position domestically? Or, or is it more about uh, reaching for global hegemony? Or are, are both uh, more or less equal priorities. That's to slightly uh, paraphrase Mari Jara's question. Greg. Well, thank you, Tim, and thanks, Murray. At a certain point in Chinese history, perhaps around about 2005, uh, we might have imagined that the Chinese gave higher priority to domestic cyber surveillance than to uh, their military capabilities. But the Chinese government, um, since at least around uh, 2008, 2009, has moved fairly convincingly to give the development of strategic power in cyberspace and military power a higher priority than it had. And by 2014, sorry, by 2014, Xi Jinping put it all on um, an equal footing. What's happened since 2014 is that uh, China has got increasing confidence that its cyber surveillance capabilities at home are very powerful and very robust. And it's got decreasing confidence that it can match the United States and its military allies in the military and strategic uses of cyberspace. And so the Chinese diplomatic um, effort and, and policy uh, settings are now struggling with um, that dilemma. And I think Simone's uh, reference to the Xi Jinping quote about the uh, difference between um, autonomy and opening up um, is really important here. I think China is stuck in that uh, situation for quite some time. Uh, China espouses a very robust long-term ambitions for equaling uh, middle power capability, uh, depending on which source you read, by 2050. Uh, 
uh, whether or not uh, China believes it can actually uh, overtake the United States in um, ICT power and cyberspace power. Um, I see almost no evidence of that belief um, anywhere uh, in China. Thank you very much. Simone, would you like to have uh, a, a final word on that? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the two aspects are somehow related. So the issue of China's security and domestic stability and the projection outside China are somehow related, uh, at least from, from what the Chinese analysts say. Um, uh, because in order to preserve China's security and stability in this field, uh, they now feel that they have somehow to project outside as well. This is true from a technological point of view. The issue uh, of the um, uh, autonomous innovation of the development of autonomous and, and um, Chinese technologies in this field um, requires somehow that China has a market outside of China to export such, such technology. So the development of, a Chinese, uh, uh, of the Chinese industry in this field requires proje projection beyond China. So this is true from a technological point of view. China wants to um, to um, uh, preserve security uh, internally, domestically, and a major issue is the reliance on foreign technology. China has to develop its own technology, and in order to do that, it, it also has to project beyond China and to, to, to gain market abroad. Uh, and this is true also politically, because there is this idea in China, not just in the cyber domain, but in general, that if China, if China wants to preserve its domestic stability, um, then it needs to acquire a greater uh, they call it uh, um, discoursing power abroad. So it, it's not only about uh, protecting China's own, uh, let's say, political security domestically, but also projecting abroad uh, um, and uh, gaining some room of maneuver within a wider discourse, a global, global discourse, so gaining some place within the global discourse. So also from a political point of view, the preservation of China's domestic stability is somehow um, related to China's projection uh, beyond China's borders, I think. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we need to bring this uh, webinar to a close. I'd like to thank uh, Greg and Simona very much indeed for your really uh, excellent presentations, which I think very importantly cast new light on China's cyber capabilities. Uh, and stimulated a lot of interest from our uh, 60 or 70 participants, uh, most of whom are still uh, still with us. Um, thank you to all those who asked questions. Apologies to those um, who um, whose questions were not in the end uh, uh, posed, but I, I, I did try to uh, uh, integrate those uh, questions into those that I did pose to uh, Greg and Simone. Um, but your, your questions made this uh, into a, a very interesting and uh, interactive session. Uh, and I'd like to thank all our participants. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, hope to see you uh, all again at uh, future webinars in this series. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>